All right, so let's move forward, ladies, to the hand washing. We talked about CDC on um, we talked about CDC on Tuesday, the Center for Disease Control. Anything dealing with diseases kind of piggybacking off of the infection cycle that we just talked about. The CDC is the, the governing company or the governing body or the governing agency, whatever you want to remember it by, is the one to find out about this disease. Where did it came from? What is it? How did it get here? How do we prevent it? How do we stop it? So because of the CDC, we follow their guidelines on how to wash our hands when we're dealing in the medical field, okay? Now, this video is a uh, short and sweet. Um, it's not a long video by far, um, but I do uh, want you guys to understand hand washing. Um, hand washing will be, uh, your knowledge will be tested on the NHA exam also, and I will quiz you on it. So it is very important, but if you, you know, understand it and recognize it, and if this is not hard for you to remember, you're going to be fine. It's hand washing, right? We do it every day. You just want to know the exact skill for the healthcare provider on how we actually, you know, supposed to do it. So give me a minute, a second, actually, and let me go ahead and get that video together for you. It's very short. I'm going to tell you as uh, soon as I get it. <laughs> you know, remember I told you guys I was slow. I'm not sure why I'm that slow, but it is like that. Uh, it's three minutes and one second. So hold on for me. Hand washing is one of the most important ways you can keep from getting sick and spreading germs to others. Dirty hands spread disease. This hand washing demonstration will show you how hand washing can get rid of germs and chemicals that get on our hands every day. This gel is like the germs and chemicals that we get from things we touch throughout the day like our toys and pets. If we then rub our eyes, nose, or mouth, or pick up something to eat, the germs or chemicals can get into our bodies and make us sick. Studies have shown that people touch their eyes, nose, and mouth about 25 times every hour without even realizing it. To get rid of these germs and chemicals, CDC recommends you follow these easy steps every time you wash your hands. Wet lather, scrub, rinse, and dry. We're going to show you the right way to do each step. First, wet your hands with clean running water. Turn off the tap and apply soap. Then, lather your hands by rubbing them together with the soap. Be sure to lather the backs of your hands between your fingers and under your nails. Scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. If you don't have a clock nearby, keep scrubbing until you've sung the happy birthday song twice. Rinse your hands well under clean running water. Dry your hands using a clean towel, electric hand dryer, or air dry them. Washing your hands using the steps we just demonstrated is very important to get hands completely clean. Let's see how well we got rid of the germs and chemicals. Great. No more germs and chemicals. Why is this so important? Germs and chemicals from unwashed hands can get into our foods and drinks when they're being prepared or when we're eating or drinking them, which can make us sick. Also, germs and chemicals from unwashed hands can be transferred to other objects like cell phones, tabletops, or toys, and then transferred to other people's hands. That's why it's so important to wash your hands following these steps. Wet, lather, scrub, rinse, and dry so you can stay healthy and help keep those around you healthy. For more information, visit cdc.gov forward slash hand wash. Okay, so like I said, just short and sweet on hand washing. I, I, I'm not going to go over it 
too much in detail, but we do know while we're washing our hands, we're trying to kill any germs if anything landed on our hands. And, you know, like everybody always said, you know, we use our, you know, hands to eat. You know, I like burgers a lot. I like chicken strips a lot. You, you know, you use your hands. Some of us females wear nails. We want to be sure that we clean our hands to its entirety. So the proper way to clean our hands or to wash our hands is to wet our hands, lather it with soap, you know, some, depending on what soap you use, you know, some facilities use the lesser brand than others, so to speak. So some of them don't lather up as white and bubble up, but long as you get all areas of your hand, rather it's the middle, the inside of your hand and the outside of your hands. Typically we should scrub in between our nails, especially if you're gonna be a phlebotomist eventually to work in a pre-op where, where people are preparing for surgery, they have actually scrub brushes, you know, for you to scrub in your nails. But other than that, you know, just on a day-to-day -day basis, make sure your nails is clean. That's why typically in the healthcare field, our nails is supposed to be a certain lit, but I know that typically things have changed and some facilities are very lenient, I know. But we do want to be sure that we scrub those areas of our inside of our hands, outside of our hands, and in our nails. Then we want to rinse. I'm gonna tell you this, when you rinse your hands, let's just say, you know, I'm under the faucet because I'm not standing up. You don't wanna rinse your hands with your hands up where the water is just running down your arm as you're rinsing your hands underneath the faucet. You wanna bring your hands downward. So when you are rinsing your hands, the water is falling in the sink, okay, in the faucet. Therefore, if you're washing your hands this way, soap and water and you're rinsing it out and then the soap is just, you know, forming, forming and just drenching down here. If you ever seen anyone to actually wipe their whole hand, that's probably because the, the water has came, you know, basically came down there. Now, if you do work in pre-op, so to speak, they do have you wash to up here. But if you ever watch Grey's Anatomy, you know, that's my favorite show, Grey's Anatomy or 911 or whatever the case may be. When you work in pre-op, you put on these long gowns that have your whole hand covered anyway to right here. Okay, and that's the purpose of it. But anyway, so back to rinsing your hands, make sure your hands is downward. Therefore, the water and the soap that you're washing off can fall in the faucet. That way, when you grab your towel or when you put your hands underneath the, the blowing machine, it's already, you know, to where water isn't actually going down your arm where it needs to go. When you dry your hand, be sure it's completely dry. Okay, do not take another sanitizing towel that already has some moisture to it to dry your hands because if you do that, then you're already, you know, your hands is moist and it's not completely dry. If you are one of the ones that like to use sanitizer in the place of hand washing, you can do that. But I do recommend don't just use sanitizer all day long. Try to after two to three patients at least wash your hands, okay? Therefore, you know, because sometimes them sanitizers get sticky or, you know, when you use it so much or vice versa. So just be mindful of those type of things um, when it comes to hand washing. And we do use the CDC option um, hand washing technique um, when it comes to it, because that's where all facilities, all medical facilities go by the CDC guidelines, okay? Any questions? I see Miss America over there. Hey, the whole family, how y'all doing? Look, she said, oh, <laughs> you didn't know your camera was showing? Oh, now we can't see you no more. Okay, so with that being said, um, hand washing is very important, ladies. You wash your hands before and after each patient, and that's exactly how you wash your hands. We want to wet it. We want to form a lather with the soap. We also want to scrub. We want to rinse and we want to dry. Typically, you do supposed to take 20 seconds to wash your hand. The reason why I'm doing this to my head is as long as you know in a textbook sense, you take 20 seconds, 
But, you know, unless you are the one that you are the one that wears a watch or, you know, Apple Watch or whatever the case may be. Once you get experience, a lot of people really, you know, not counting the 20 seconds, but properly, if someone was to call you out to wash their hands, um, to wash your hands, just know that it's 20 seconds. So literally, if you have to sing the happy birthday song twice, they're, they're not going to laugh at you at that because that's what everybody in the medical field is taught. So that's how you can just stay on track or you can just look at your watch. Okay. But 20 seconds. So if you are tested um, in book sense, it does take 20 seconds to wash your hands each time, each before and after. Now, if your hands or anything or any area of your body get contaminated with any chemicals or any bodily fluid of that nature, it turns from 20 seconds to 20 minutes. You have to be sure that you scrub that area for 20 minutes because now you have been exposed to chemicals or any other thing, okay? Hand washing is just a simple uh, precautionary measure, so that's 20 seconds. I don't want you to get that confused with hand washing versus being contaminated by some type of um, chemical, okay? 20 seconds versus 20 minutes. All right, so moving forward, I, I'm assuming that we do not have um, any questions moving forward. Hopefully um, that my explanation is good enough so far from what we covered, okay? So now I wanna go into patient preparation, ladies. Uh, before I get into the, the, or the needle order, we're going to continue the patient identification and the patient preparation on Saturday. But I do want to kind of give you a little insight of preparing your patient. Um, let me go ahead and show my screen as I'm talking here. Okay, so right now I have a, what we call a requisition. I think I mentioned it to you guys on Tuesday slightly. If I didn't, then that must've been another class. But this is what we call, I think I did. This is what we call a requisition. Typically, i.e., for example, a doctor's order. This is what the patient is gonna give you so you can know what the doctor ordered. It's going to have the patient's name up here, the patient's date of birth, the patient's social, the patient phone number. All of these things are going to be filled in. The doctor's information is going to be filled in here, too. Some things you fill in afterwards. Once you draw the patient's blood, when, once you do your venipuncture, then you put the date that it was collected, the time, and uh, for sure the date and the time. The laboratory medical technician that gets the blood and the requisition will fill in the other things, okay? If the patient is fasting or non-fasting, that is what you check, and I'm going to talk to you about that, okay? But first thing is first, I'm going to put this screen back up here in just a minute, but I do want you to get used of um, identifying your patient, so let me tell you about identifying your patient. Let me make sure. Yeah. Okay. So I want to tell you this. I get a lot of students to tell me, oh, I had my blood drawn. They didn't do this. Oh, I had my blood drawn. They still do this. Oh, they did that. I do want to let you know that it is some experienced phlebotomist. And it could be some fairly new phlebotomists that learned in a way or was trained in a way to where they do things different. I'm going to always tell you, once you get out in the real world, you know, we do learn shortcuts or whatever the case may be. But I'm not going to teach you that. I'm going to teach you how the scope of practice of phlebotomy goes. So therefore, you will know for your textbook and to practice in a good way. Once you get out in that real world and you start seeing things and, you know, you say, oh, that makes sense. That's easy. Hey, you know, you're done. I'm, we're done, right? You're going to learn different things. So I just want to let you know. But, but as I'm teaching things and showing you things, I would like to know 
that if, okay, well, you took your kids to get their blood drawn and the phlebotomist didn't do this or the phlebotomist didn't do that, I would like to know because as you're learning, things would make sense. I get a lot of students now that when they go draw their, get their blood drawn or their kids, you know, they take their kids to the lab and they'll text me, oh, the, the phlebotomist didn't invert the tube. And I say, oh, okay. Well, if the blood results come back hemolyzed, you're gonna already know why, you know? So with that being said, we're gonna learn all of that. So first things first, before you do anything, you have to be sure that you have your correct patient. You have to be sure that you identify your patient. I just showed you the requisition. So when I tell you my name is Juanetta Chopin, that's how you're gonna know so to speak, because the requisition that I give you has Juanetta Chopin on there. Depending on where you work, like I said, depending on the facilities protocol, they may also ask you to ask for the patient's identification, driver's license or state ID and or insurance card as well. So be mindful that that may happen to you. If it happens to you, by all means, that's what they want you to do. But in class, for learning purposes, we're just going to use the requisition for identifying purposes, but long as you know that your facility will ask you for other things. First thing is first, in order to properly identify your patient in my purple box, I'm going to let me let me just say this because this is what you're going to get used to seeing. Ooh, I said flyers. Two identifiers. So on your in your textbook and on your your national exam, it's going to ask you how many you how many unique identifiers it's going to take you to identify your patient i would hope you would say two those two are name and date of birth absolutely first and last name if the patients want to tell you their middle name because they have someone in the family they have the same name as them and they want to be sure that they say their whole name then by all means let them do it but in order to identify your patient, it has to be their full name and their date of birth. So whatever is on that requisition, if that facility tells you that you have to show them the ID, I mean, you have to get the ID or the driver's license for them, whatever is on their driver's license. OK, now, with that being said, when you identify your patient, let me tell you a little bit of how it's done. You have to get them to state their name. So for example, if you're calling me to the back and then we sit down and you'll say, okay, Ms. Chopin, how you doing? Or are you, I just want to be sure I have the right person. Are you Winetta Chopin? Then I say yes, or I can say no, whatever the case, but you told me my name. So you have to get the patient to state their name. So when you call them to the back, you say, okay, can you state your name for me? Then I will state my name, Winetta Chopin. You also get them to spell their name, okay? Because some people, um, hold on. Because some people names have, uh, uh, are the same, are unique in the same way. For example, my name is pronounced Juanetta, but some people call me Juanita because, you know, I mean, it sounds like it, I guess. It, you know, it doesn't look like it because it's spelled Juanetta just as it sounds. So I do get a lot of people to um, misinterpret my name. So again, my last name is Chopin, C-H-O-P-A-N-E. But a lot of people say Miss Champagne, like the wine or, you know, the champagne. So with that being said, let's just say it's two of us in the waiting room a Juanetta Chopin and a Juanita Champagne. Let's just say Juanetta Chopin was in the restroom at the time that you said Juanetta Chopin. 
But for whatever reason, Juanita Champagne stood up because she's probably used to people mispronouncing her name anyway. So then you like, okay, come to the back with me. Okay, so technically right now you don't know that you have the wrong patient. So that's fine. That happens all the time. So you called your patient and then you bring your patient to your blood drawing area to the back, to the lab. Then once you sit your patient down, that's when you say, okay, can you state your, well, you get the requisition. And then if you need to ask for the ID or the insurance card, you'll do those first. Then once you do that, then you'll say, okay, miss, can you state your name uh, for me? And then that person will probably say, we'll need a, we'll need a champagne. And then you'll say, can you spell your name for me? She'll probably say J-U-A-N. And then immediately you're looking at the role and uh, at the roster from the requisition that from you calling the patient when they signed in. Juanita's, Juanetta is not spelled like that. Juanetta is spelled W-A-N-N-E-T-T-A. So then you're probably thinking, oh, Lord, I have the wrong patient. So then you move forward because they, they're spelling a different name. You move forward and you ask them to state their date of birth. Same, same difference. Don't ask them to, don't tell them their date of birth. Have them state it to you. So then she gives a date of birth that's not the same to what needs to be done. So therefore you realize at that point you do not have the correct patient. So you'll say, okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Juanita. Do you mind going back to the waiting room? It's another patient that I was calling you, your y'all's name or you guys' names are similar. So with that being said, that's how you properly identify your patient. Remember, 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 you're gonna get see this again. It's only two unique identifiers. Okay, so it's two unique identifiers. So can they give me a social security card or can they give me a passport or can they give me a, a copy of their birth certificate? No, the two unique identifiers is name and date of birth. That's it. You get them to state their name, spell their name. Then you get them to state their date of birth. Once you realize that you have the correct patient, then you move forward. Do I have any questions regarding those? Please remember, it's two unique identifiers, and of those two, it's name and date of birth. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Easy peasy. That's how you identify your patient. You will begin to get comfortable in how you deliver and how you speak to your patient. Um, that's something that I can help you with because I will. we will role play in class. So it'll somewhat get you there. That way you could just practice. A lot of people after the first weekend say, oh, I'm gonna go home and practice with my kids or you know, with my husband or something. And just simple, you know, ask those two questions because some people do have a, have a hard time getting out of the habit of not telling the, not telling the patient their name. You don't wanna say, okay, Ms. Chopin, can you spell your name? Well, you just, you know, kind of told her her name a little bit, right? So you just wanna say, can you state your name for me? Okay, can you spell it? Okay, can you state your date of birth? However your lingo is, if you're the type of person that say, can you tell me your name or can you tell me your date of birth? I don't think nothing is wrong with that, just long as you get the patient to tell you first. So whatever verb, verbiage you use, you know, long as it's professional enough, then you use that if that's what's gonna get you comfortable, okay? Now, moving on in our yellow box here, um, it's going to take more than right now for you to remember this, but we're going to role play in class. But I want to just get you in the habit of interviewing your patient while you're getting the supplies together. You don't know what supplies right now because we haven't went over the supplies, which is what we're going to go over on Saturday. But once you properly identified your patient in order to move efficiently, as you're talking and communicating with your patient, you wanna kind of slightly give them an interview. This is exactly what some of my students say. Um, some of the phlebotomists don't ask them. It is what it is, but once we start to say it over and over and go through it over and over, and when we have the segment of the patient complications as well, you're gonna be like, oh, 
that's that this that's good i'm glad that i asked these questions when i get report with my patients from nurse to nurse if someone gives me a problem like you know they've been falling out the bed all day or you know you need to watch them because they've been nauseated all day they've been vomiting all day or if they tell me oh you know your my patient passed out a little earlier I am really loving to hear that because as soon as I get report, then I'm going to that patient first because obviously this is my fragile patient. And I'm gonna tell myself, okay, you need to go check on this patient at least every hour. I don't want no problems on my, on my time watch. You know, sometimes things happen, but if you can prevent them, then I'm that person that's trying to prevent them. You know, you know, when we went over professionalism and we talk about on your conscience, being conscientious, I'm kind of like one of those people. Things that happen, I know. But if I can try to prevent them, I'm going to try to prevent them to the best of my ability. So with that being said, crossing over to phlebotomy, as you're getting your equipment together, I want you to kind of do a slight interview with your patient. You're kind of multitasking. You're talking to your patient and you're also getting your equipment together. I want you to prepare your patient in a way you can call it preparing your patient or interview questions. I like to call it preparing your patient for the venipuncture. I don't really like to use the word interview, you know, because you're not interviewing them for, the, for a job or a position. You're just preparing them to get their blood, you know, work done. So remember how we, I just mentioned on the requisition, it says fasting or non-fasting. There is typical uh, blood work that the doctor wants on fasting. Fasting means that the person did not have anything to eat or drink within a certain time frame. And typically it's between eight to 10 hours, okay? It's never six. Let's just say if it's eight o'clock and someone said that they last ate at one o'clock in the morning, that's too soon. And the doctor wants it, wanted on fasting. Okay, Ms. Chopin, I'm so sorry. The doctor wanted wants your blood work on fasting and you last had something to eat at one. So I'm going to have to ask you to come back. Can you come back tomorrow? And just try to remember, you know, not to have anything to eat between eight to 10 hours. If it was eight hours exactly, perfect. If it, if, if, if it wasn't nine or 10 hours, that's fine. Longest is a minimum of eight hours, but fasting generally is between eight to 10 hours. Fasting, a patient has not had anything to eat or drink within a certain time frame. Typically, when you go on your um, physical, most of the time, once a year, the doctor wants to know your blood work on fasting, nothing to eat or drink. Typically, if you are a diabetic or a person that has cholesterol issues, when you get your blood, your cholesterol and your diabetes checked, typically those are the most important two that has to be fasting. So rather it's not your physical, but every three months you get your uh, uh, glucose level, which is diabetes and your cholesterol, cholesterol level done every three months. I'm almost certain the doctor is going to order that those two on fasting because why get your blood drawn if you ate and you're diabetic, you know, your sugar is going to be high. Okay. Also, why get your blood drawn for cholesterol when you just ate a whole basket of Popeye's chicken or whatever, okay? So just keep those in mind and I'll go over them again when we start talking about the order of draw and uh, most common blood tests. But the, uh, glucose and cholesterol are for sure the most common two that is to be on fasting, you know, every time it's done, okay? But I do want you to just realize um, uh, uh, um, the first question and to prepare your patient, if that box on the requisition say fasting, the first question you should ask me, okay, Ms. Chopin, I see that the doctor has ordered your blood work today on the fasting, meaning nothing to eat or drink. Are you fasting? I may tell you yes. Okay. Some patients lie. So you want to go a little further and you say, okay, when was the last time you had something to eat or drink? So if I tell you the last time I ate was six o'clock last night, then you'll know that I'm good based on what time that I'm in the lab. But let's just say if I did tell you, well, I had a piece of sandwich. Oh God, I forgot. I had a piece of sandwich at one o'clock. It should be fine, huh? I just had a piece and it's like eight o'clock. No, you're not fasting. Okay. What if I tell you I'm fasting, but because you asked me when was, when was the last time I had something to eat or drink? 
I may tell you I had a piece of banana this morning because I believe that's not breakfast. That's just a piece of banana, right? So if I tell you that, then that's also the patient hasn't been fasting. So that question, if the if it's checked on the requisition, that question is asked first because if I'm not fasting, it's no need to continue nothing. It's no need to ask me the rest of the questions. It's no need to continue getting the supplies out to do the venipuncture because the doctor ordered this on fasting and I ate, you know, within less than eight hours ago. Okay. So that's why that's important. If you move and press forward, knowing that the patient is not fasting and you draw their blood work, then obviously 10 times out of 10, so to speak they may have falsified results because he wants to know what it's like on fasting with nothing to eat in the stomach. And so you went forward now to draw the blood, but let's just say, I know what that is, right? As a patient. And I'm like, oh, I just had a piece, you know, a piece of sandwich. I'm gonna tell her because I know maybe, maybe I come to get my blood drawn every three months. No, I'm fasting, you know, um, I'm, I'm fasting Miss per Perla. Um, and then you're going to ask me, when was the last time I had something to eat or drink? I'm thinking quick on my toes and I tell you seven. So I know that that's been eight hours and you draw my blood. You can't fault yourself for that. It is what it is. Whatever results come out to the doctor is up to the doctor's discretion to move on how he or she wants to move. They may look at it and say, okay, well, I'm going to have you come back to draw your blood in two weeks because that's what doctors do sometimes. So I'm just telling you how it is on both ends of the stick. Just don't draw the patient's blood with knowing the knowing intentions that they're not fasting. But if they tell you that they're fasting and they give you all the right answers and you proceed on, then it's not your fault at all. OK, it's, you know, up to the doctor to choose how they want to move with the lab results. OK, so first things first, as a phlebotomist, you can can understand how it is important for your job to do some things before you even draw the blood, okay? So moving on. So the fasting question I call that was question number one. Question number two, it's very nice. If you ask me, Ms. Chopin, have you ever had any complications? And I may not even know what complications is, so you may wanna dump, dummy down the question for your patient. So, Ms. Chopin, have you ever had any problems in the past when you get your blood drawn? You know, I might say, oh, no, no, I get my blood drawn all the time. Everything is fine. Or I may tell you, girl, I'm so scared of needles. I know I come every three months. Please don't let me look at that needle. If I look at that needle, I'm going to start to feel like I got to pass out. OK, so with that being said, you know how to handle me. You know, you may want to recline me in the recliner or you may want to say, OK, Ms. Chopin, you know, let me let you lay down. Or you may want to say, okay, well, I'm going to let you know when I'm completing the blood stick so you can turn your head. But you may still want to take the initiative to have the patient sit in a reclining chair or either lay down on the table so you can draw their blood. Because if they happen to faint, they, they're already in a position where, you know, they're laid back or laying down. So you don't have to worry about them falling on the floor. We will talk about patient complications later. I have a whole segment of it. So the questions that you may have, trust me, we're going to go over them. Okay. But that is nice to ask your patient. That way, you know how to proceed. You're getting report. And the only best way for anybody to tell you about my body is me. So if you ask me that, I should be able to tell you, okay? Or I may, be, I may tell you, I don't know why, but sometimes once they finish drawing my blood, as soon as I get up to go, I, I, I feel dizzy. So that'll let you know when you're done with everything and you say, Miss Chopin, okay, I'm done. I'm going to help you up. We're going to get up slowly. That's just, you're preventing anything on your watch, okay? At least you're trying to, okay? That's question number two. Question number three. Michelle Payne, do you have an arm preference um, that you like me to try first? If I just told you I come get my blood drawn every three months and this is your first time seeing me, I'm sure I'm the best person for you to ask. And typically in real life and even in class, like I said, everybody's going to stick me. Even in class, 
I have scars. On my right arm, I have more scars than my left. My left arm is better to deal with. You can see everything, even in my hand, okay? So even in real life, I tell them, because uh, they some of them don't ask, right? So before they even start, I, I say my, my left hand, I tell them my left arm is my best arm, okay? Then they'll just take it from there. So it just give you, it's just, you're help you're giving the patient the you know the 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 accountability to kind of be a part of you know they're getting their blood drawn no when someone come get their blood drawn it's not going to take an hour you probably think it because of me teaching you on everything with the same but typically once you start moving fast and you call your patient to the back identify your patient get your equipment your supplies together interview your patient get your blood it should take no more than 15 minutes okay but just as i'm explaining it to you it may sound like the process is long but it's not okay now moving on to the fourth question do you know if you're on any blood thinners, Ms. Chopin? You may get a patient to say, oh yeah, I know I, I take, I know I take a baby aspirin every day. I know that's a blood thinner. Or they may tell you, oh yeah, I take this every day. You know, the doctor told me that's a blood thinner. Or they may tell you, girl, you know, I take a lot of medicine. I don't know if I take a blood thinner or not. You know, I, I'm not sure. You know, so with that being said, it I, I want to get you comfortable to know. It's okay if the patient doesn't know what they take. It gives you more intuition if they do tell you they are taking blood thinners, but let me tell you the reason why it's good to ask. After you finish the blood draw and you withdraw your needle, to apply the gauze. Just imagine if you're getting your blood drawn and I, I'm sure I would hope that almost all of you had your blood drawn before. You know, when they remove the needle out your skin, pop the tourniquet, remove the needle out your skin and apply that gauze to your skin and you hold pressure or either they hold pressure and they hold pressure for about three to five minutes. When they come back, they're supposed to look to see if bleeding has stopped before they give you a Band-Aid or wrap it up with that Coban. What it is is that if someone is on blood thinner, you need to know because when you lift it up and bleeding is still there after three to five minutes, you're like, oh, she did tell me she was on blood thinner. So that just tells you that you need to hold pressure longer. That's all. So let's just say, don't be nervous. If you say, oh my God, what if they don't tell me if they're on blood thinner? Just do as you're supposed to do as a phlebotomist. I'm going to teach you to make sure firm, firm pressure is held for three to five minutes. I teach you to have, if the patient is capable, have the patient hold pressure for three to five minutes because you're going to be having other things that you are doing with that specimen that we're going to do this weekend. Have the patient hold pressure for about three to five minutes. Once you're done doing what you're doing, then you are responsible because it should have been three to five minutes already. You are responsible before you secure that bandage at all. Do not ever put a Band-Aid or a tape um, on that gauze without making sure bleeding has stopped. Once you lift up that gauze and if bleeding has stopped, that's good. It's just that if someone is bleeding, and still bleeding at the time and blood is, you know, still um, coming out, then that just lets you know that, you know, they're probably most likely on a blood thinner. So if I tell you, yeah, girl, I'm on a blood thinner, you know, I know that we need to be sure that I'm not bleeding when I leave, or I just tell you I'm on a blood thinner. It is just your job to be sure before you let me go that there is no active bleeding going on. Long as there's no active, active bleeding going on, you put that gauze back on my arm and then you secure it with that Band-Aid or that tape that I'm going to explain all the equipment to you on Saturday, okay? So the moral of the blood thinner question is just to kind of be ahead of the game if they are on blood thinners to where you know you may have to hold pressure for longer than three to five minutes, okay? Any questions regarding these, any questions? questions regarding these questions. We're going to do them again. Everybody is going to talk to the mannequin or talk to each other. We're going to role play, but I am getting you prepared to how to identify your patient and how to prepare your patient for the blood stick, the venipuncture uh, stick that you're going to be doing. Any questions at all? Okay. And you can screenshot this whiteboard like I always say, okay? 
All right. So let me go. And then I am recording now. I forgot. So I am recording. So let me go ahead and close my whiteboard for a second. Let's move forward, ladies. All right. Let's move forward. Now I am showing you um, the needle. Well, I'm showing you a syringe with a needle at attached to it, right? Uh, okay. Okay, well, I don't have a syringe here, but just looking at the picture, I will, everyone, everyone will hold a syringe with a needle. I mean, I have everything for you. So just be prepared for Saturday. But this right here, I want you to just kind of look at this. This is uh, a syringe with the needle attached, okay? I will tell you there will be some instances that it's still, it's kind of like an old school way to draw blood. And I will tell you, because you will be tested on it in class, I will bring it up again and I will let you know, you may have to use the syringe technique. So if I say that, that means that you may have to use a syringe with a needle attached to draw someone's blood. Have you ever, ever heard anyone say, oh, he has fragile veins or he has collapsed veins that means that soon as you stick the you felt the vein but soon as you stick the needle in the veins basically die okay i'll talk to you about that later on this weekend but just to give you a little insight you know the whole moral of this uh lecture this section is to give you um information on the needle but i'm just going to also just kind of give you a little insight of the syringe if you ever was to use a syringe, your syringe has to have a plunger, okay, where you pull it back to suck up, either sucking up the blood, or if you are going to um, be given injections at some point in your career, you would pull the uh, plunger back so it can suck up the medications that you're about to give as an uh, injection, a shot, a vaccine, whichever one, okay? The plunger is what you pull back and what you push, push in. The barrel is the middle of the syringe where it has the measurements at of how you know how much blood you have or how much medicine you're putting in that barrel, okay? Now, when we move more forward, let me try to bring it up. You see, you have your needle here. Typically, the needle is of metal statue, okay? The, the needle. And I think we talked about it a little bit on Tuesday. I'm trying to get close. So this whole metal object is your needle, okay? Let me tell you something. Because you're going to be the one drawing blood. When you draw blood, when we start doing our venipunctures, this whole needle length is not going into someone's vein, never, okay? So as a phlebotomist, I don't want you to be like, okay, now I'm going to be the one drawing the blood, uh, how much part of the needle we put in, okay? I'm going to teach you that, but I do want to let you know the whole needle does not go into the vein. The only time the whole needle goes into someone is if you are given an injection, okay? But we're not giving injections. We're actually drawing blood, but I do want to let you know, first thing is first about a needle. When it's inserted into a vein, you're not putting the whole length of the needle into someone's vein, okay? Now, moving forward, if you're going to use the syringe technique, there are separate needles that you open up and you basically just attach it to the needle, which is what this is. And so that's how come you have this section that's called the hub. We'll talk about that and you'll be able to see it. Everyone will get their own needle, a syringe with the needle and you'll be able to see it, okay? So the attached part, you will attach the hub to the syringe, okay? Now, when we go into this area, D, we cooking with grits now. This is what I want to make sure that you are aware of, the actual needle, which is what I am showing you now, okay? The actual needle. So I want you to concentrate on the magnifying part of the, of the needle that it made bigger for us, okay? It may, you can see the shaft, you see the lumen, you see the bevel. Let me explain. You see the shaft here? Typically, 
when you insert the, the needle into someone's vein, you are inserting to the shaft, okay? So I would say the little circular area, the opening, the lumen and the bevel, when you stick that bevel into someone's skin, you're basically going three inches more, which is the shaft. So typically, if you see the needle here that I'm showing, typically where my nail is, is what you would insert into the patient right here, not this whole needle, okay? Now, the lumen part of the needle is the opening of the needle. I don't know if you can see it, but you will be able to see it in person. You can see something probably. If I'm turning it around, you can see it's an opening right there, okay? <laughs> that whole, yeah, that whole opening is the lumen, meaning that opening can be small, big, you know, whatever size. It's the size of the opening, okay? It's the opening. Now, when you look at it again and you see the opening, the actual opening itself is called the belt. Okay, as you look at this diagram here, you all will also have uh, this diagram in your folders that you get on Saturday. Okay, but by that time, you're going to be comfortable with the needle because we're going to do uh, so many things regarding the needle on Saturday, but at least you'll have it um, so you can review it later. But the actual opening itself is called the bevel, but the inside of the opening is called the lumen. And that lumen can be of different sizes because there's a such thing as different sizes of needles, okay? Now, you got the shaft of the needle. Well, first off, you have the whole needle. Then you have the shaft of the needle, the opening of the needle, which is how big it is, is the lumen. And then the actual opening itself is called the bevel. Let me tell you something about that bevel. You see the bevel again, okay? I have it here. The bevel, if you can see, is upward. The lumen, the whole part of the needle is facing up to the sky. It's not facing downward. When we start to do our venipunctures and our blood draws, that bevel has to be upward at all times. On Saturday, we'll review it. I'll have activities for you to do to get comfortable with that. I do need you to know going into Saturday what the bevel is and how is it, what, how, how is it deciphered? What is the uniform of it? Is it upward or downward? And I hope that you will say that this opening is, is down. I mean, always is upward. Oh, I'm trying to get you to see it. I know it can't magnify as good, but at least you can see some of it. Um, my thing went away. Okay, so with that being said, that is the bevel. The bevel is always up. Let me tell you something. If the bevel is ever downward, when you insert the needle into the patient's vein, not only is it going to be uh, a little painful to them, because when you look at the bevel in person, you'll see there's a pointy area because the 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 lumen is like an oval shape. When it's pointed up that sharp part is going into my vein first. If it's downward, then the opening is basically going into the vein and then you're like, it's kind of like a double stick. So you wanna be able to insert the needle into someone's vein just with a slight poke and that's it. Also, if you have the bevel downward, the blood can't go nowhere, okay? So when you attach your needle, your blood tube and the bevel is down, the blood is actually leaking into the tissue of the skin. And we'll talk about what that is called. So we need to be sure that the bevel of the needle is upward. So when you insert that uh, needle in me, that's how the blood is going to flow through the bevel so it can go into its tube. Am I losing anyone um, with this, with the bevel? Okay, all right. So moving right along, you have the whole needle, you have the shaft area of the needle, the lumen, which is the, the area, the, circumfer the circumference of the hole, and then the hole itself is called the bevel. So you're gonna be used to, to hearing that terminology. If you hear anybody say bevel, that's what it is. You're gonna also hear me say, okay, is your bevel up? 
Okay. So I just need you to, from today, be comfortable with knowing what the bevel is, which is the opening of the needle. How big the opening is, is called the lumen. Okay, you're going to see this all in person. Everybody will get their own needle, not to stick their stuff, of course, but, you know, to, to get used to everything. Any questions? May you please repeat the bevel and the lumen one more time? The, the bevel is the opening of the, the bevel is the opening that you see at the tip of the needle. The lumen is how big that opening is. It's the size which is what I'm finna, uh, I'm about to uh, reiterate a little bit to tell you about the sizes of the needles. So the bevel is the opening and the lumen is how big that opening is, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, that's very important because you can only know, ladies, when you're dealing with the needle, that's the most important thing because that is what's sticking your patient to get blood, right? Cutting into a vein for phlebotomy. Okay, let me show you this. Ooh. All right, so this is a image of different, different needles, okay? I want a little bit of participation from somebody when I ask this. So for example, I'm sure you're noticing a bunch of stuff with the with this, okay? You see, you have some big needles, some small needles. You can even see the bevel. You see the opening here, that's the bevel. And the lumen is how big or small the opening is, okay? Somebody tell me what you what you recognize about these needles. The different colors. The different colors. And, and the different colors represent what, you think? I would assume the sizes. Perfect. Now that we, we decipher that there are different colors to, re to, to uh, resemble the sizes, what do you notice about the sizes? Um, the bigger the number, the smaller the needle. Oh, I see that too. So in needle life, ladies, in phlebotomy, in nursing, in whatever, whatever is, whatever is using a needle, you see that the smallest needle that you see here is a 30. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, the smallest needle you see here is a 30, but 30 is a big number. Then you go here to the first one, 14. 14 is smaller than 30, but this needle is big, right? So in needle life, the smaller the number is really the bigger the needle. The bigger the number is the smaller the needle. Did I lose anybody with that? Okay, so let's say, what if we had options to choose from in class? What if we had a 21, a 22, and a 23? Which one is the smallest size needle? 23. 23, perfect. Okay, let's say that we had needle sizes 16, 17, and 18. Which one is the biggest needle? 16. 16, perfect ladies. So I just need you to understand that, okay? Um, it is simple, easy peasy. I, again, I do say that a lot, but I do. I don't want you to be overthinking nothing. Simple, straight like that, okay? The bigger the number, the smaller size of the lumen. The, the smaller the number, the bigger size of the lumen. OK, I will teach you in class what's the most common size needles to use, which what we use in class is 21, 22, 23. OK, some of these sizes are used for injections, not for by way of phlebotomy. But 
I use this example just to give you a, a insight on just understanding uh, the needle sizes, okay? So now when we go back to the lumen, and remember I explained to you the lumen is the area of that hole, how big it is. So now, you know, if we have a 21 size needle, that's how big the lumen is. It's a 21 gauge, 18 gauge, 19, I mean, you know, 15 gauge, 30 gauge, whatever. Okay. So the bigger the number is really the smaller the needle. The smaller the number is really the bigger the needle. Very important. We're going to do it over and over in class. I'm going to quiz you. I believe it's on tomorrow's quiz. The national exam is going to quiz you. When you are actually drawing someone's blood, that is important to know the, the sizes of the needles. You don't want to grab this big needle and then now the people are not going to want to come to you no more. Oh, she used the big needle on me and da 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 da. But I'm going to give you some insight on phlebotomy. Typically, you know, phlebotomy is basically 21, 22, 23 typically, you know. Now, in some cases, if you have to use the syringe method technique, then you can use the smaller needles because those are single detached needles that you can put onto a syringe to use very small because those were meant for injections, but you can also draw blood with those detachable needles that you'll see in class. But I do need you to, to, to remember the bevel, the lumen, the shaft, because when we start doing our technique with the vein pad, I'm going to ask you, how far are you going to insert the needle into the vein? Hopefully you'll say the shaft. Or you may say three inches past the bevel. Because when you insert that bevel, I mean that needle, the bevel has to be covered underneath the skin. We're going to do it. We're going to do it over and over in class. Don't worry. We're going to do it, okay? But I do need you to be understanding what the bevel is, what the lumen is, what the shaft is of the needle. I do need you to make sure that you know the bevel is always, which is the hole is always pointing upward when you insert the needle, okay? And I need you to understand the demographic of the sizes of the needles. The smaller the number is a big needle. The bigger the number is a small needle, okay? All right. Any questions? <laughs> okay, I have one question. Okay. Okay. Do the colors like for the gauges do they remain the same like in any like healthcare setting? Yeah, pretty much they pretty much they remain the same. But I do not want to take I don't want you to take my word for gold because just like everything else that have different brands, you may have facilities that use McKesson uh, brand. Uh, medical supplies, McKesson, you may have a facility that use BD Vacutainer or something. So they could change in variations. I'm going to teach you in class to always look at the label. So for example, good question. So let's just say your brain is like all the pinks are size 20. And it could very well be. And you never ran into a problem. But let's just say all of a sudden this company now want to use, you know, Johnson and Johnson needles, you know, and they pink is really, you know, a size 18. So I'm going to teach you when we do the supplies, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to teach you how to read the labels. Even when we do the blood tubes, we're going to be reading the labels. I need you to be, have that as a good habit. So to answer your question, typically the colors are the same, but it can change depending on the brand that your lab use. So always look at the label so you can know what needle size you're using, okay? Let's just say you're working for this lab and you've been working for this lab for three years. Okay, I mean, you, I mean you, you'll feel comfortable because you know all the supplies and the equipment. But let's just say you was working for LabCorp, you know, for three years, and now you're working for Quest. Now, they, they supplies may be a little different. So just be mindful to read the label. So that's a good question. Um, I, I thank you for an, uh, answering that or asking that. I'm sorry. Um, but in class, when you hear me say, okay, read the label, you may literally ask me a question. Before I answer it, I'm going to tell you, read the label. And I'm not saying it to be mean or to get out of context, but it's kind of like a learning catching mechanism that even though I have the answer for you, the answer I'm giving you is going to give you the answer. So 
just to kind of let you know that's how you know I kind of roll a little bit so you can get used to seeing those things right now you don't have those things in front of you but when you have those things in front of you I'm gonna tell you how to find the answer without telling you so to speak okay all right any questions any more questions I guess I could say okay all right, now it's 8.09 and um, I want to at least introduce this to you guys. <clears throat> um, well, first, let me reshow that requisition because I did that explanation and I just wanna be sure you do understand what I was meaning. So, you know, right here where it says fasting and non-fasting, that's what you will check, okay? Now, if the dark, it, oh, I'm getting tongue talk tied. If the doctor ordered it as fasting, it will say on the on the result uh, um, on the requisition. It'll say fasting. Or if they are stat results, meaning you need to draw them right now, it'll say stat or ASAP. The requisition will give you all the notes that you need to get you know that you need to hear or see on the requisition. Okay, this is what you would go by. Some of these things with the insurance and stuff like that, you know, you're not going to too much worry about that part because typically the doctor's office do that. The primary insurance, the member stuff. Your thing is to verify the patient. If your um, facility wants you to get their insurance card, that's all you're going to do is make a copy of it. And then whoever's in the billing department of your lab, your laboratory, they do the rest. Okay, because they want to be sure they get paid <laughs> for the blood draws. Okay, so but this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a whole skit. Your you have a requisition in your um, folder, so your requisitions are already going to be filled out for a fake patient. You know, Jane Doe, John Doe, one of them types. But it's for you know for you to learn because I want to get you a, a custom. I do want to say this requisition has all of these different tests on there, right? There is no way that I can teach you all these tests, but I will teach you the most common two to three tests that goes in these blood tubes that we're going to learn when we start doing the order of draw. And it's a big portion of your phlebotomy career, and it's a big portion of your exam. OK, so I'm going to be sure to explain it in the most suitable way. But when I tell you some of the topics that you need to reiterate and make sure you also study on your own, the order of draw will be one of those sections, okay? But I will teach you how to read this requisition because I will teach you that on the side where my little cursor is going, this gives you already a cheat note on what color tube it goes in. I'm gonna talk to you about it, okay? Just to kind of, you know, get the blood flowing when we start talking about the blood tubes. But your requisition is very important. You will have a requisition, matter of fact, request requisition in your folder, and you will also have a separate paper that gets you uh, comfortable with what's supposed to be on the requisition for you as the phlebotomist. I'm going to tell you all that. Your book will also have all those things. Um, I will tell you what page everything is on your book so you can go back and read over that yourself. OK, uh, some things I will read from the book, some things I won't because it's all I believe that just telling you so you can visually and when your hands is on it, then later you're going to go back and read it. It was like, ah, oh, she said all this, you know, highlight what you need to highlight to review for yourself. OK, a requisition. Each lab have their own unique requisitions. So I also want you to keep that in mind. Uh, I will show you in class. Um, some different requisitions from, from different, you know, companies around, you know, just printing them out so you can see that they are different, but yet the same. So I will show you that. All right. Give me one second. Let me get this together. All right, ladies. I, I have said a lot of knowledge. I'm going to end tonight with this. I have a video for this. So. Before we start on Saturday, after we meet each other and get our bags, the video to this will be a continuation of tonight because I'm not going to get to it. We're going to start with the order of draw video. 
then we'll get into the equipment and so forth and I'll be on schedule by then. But I want you to know, this is a, a image of a human arm. I need you to know, typically in the arm area that we're gonna be drawing blood from only, the video is gonna let you know, we never draw blood from a forearm. The, 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 the forearm of the arm is always the inside of the arm. I got someone to tell me from my last class, I saw a needle in the forearm, you know, when um, my somebody, cousin or somebody was in the hospital. Well, when she said it like that, I was like, well, that, that was an IV, I'm sure. So that, so IVs have different routes um, from drawing blood. As a phlebotomist, you're not gonna be worrying about no IVs. You're not gonna start no IVs. You don't handle an IV. If you are working in the hospital or working in a uh, surgical setting where a patient has an IV, you don't fool with the nurse does or the doctor does, okay? I'm just telling you that if someone does have a needle on the forearm, it's probably an IV, okay? But by way of drawing blood, just to get blood and be done, you never draw blood in the forearm and you never draw blood in the inner side of the wrist, right here. You can draw blood right here where our little Jane Avery bracelets are or our watches, Apple watches are, because this is considered part of the hand. I will explain it more because it's a whole video over this topic, right? But in this area of the arm is where we're gonna concentrate. And from where my shirt basically starts to right here before I get to the wrist. That's where these veins lie. It is a order of vein. So for example, if you need to draw blood on me, you need to check my medium cubical vein first. Typically, that's the vein that sits smack dab in the middle of the arm in the crease. Ooh, my vein is good today, y'all. I hope it's good <laughs> when it's time to draw. But we'll talk about that later because I got to drink water. But right here, smack dab in the middle of the arm. Okay, it's called the median cubicle vein. You can screenshot this if you want, but I am recording it. So as soon as it uploads, I can send it to you guys. The, you know, I've been recording all this time. That is vein number one. Let's just say you feel there, but you don't feel anything. You say, Miss Chopin, I don't feel nothing. Okay, so then you move on to vein of choice number two, which is called the cephalic. C-E-P-H-A-L-I-C, -E cephalic. As you can see, it really also kind of lies in the middle of the arm, but it branches off to the side of it. So right now, if you're feeling your arm, <laughs> tell me somebody is, but if you have your arm out and you're trying to feel in the middle of your arm, if you're hydrated enough because you do not have a tourniquet. So because the tourniquet is what helps the arm pop out that we're going to talk about the tourniquet the little latex uh thing that wraps around the arm that helps uh dilate the vein but if you have good veins and you're hydrated you should be able to feel your veins if you feel a vein and then if you move over towards the outer area of your arm and you start to feel something else that's your cephalic vein the median lies directly in the middle and kind of on the side going towards the outer area of the arm let's just say on the side of your thumb when it's like this when your arm is like this the cephalic lab lies on the outer side of your arm so if your medium is right here median cubicle vein is here right on the side of it towards the outer edge you should feel something else and it actually goes all the way into the hand vein but anyway we're gonna get there. Cephalic is the second vein of choice. So then you say, oh, what Miss Chopin, I do. I do feel this vein here, I'm gonna go for it. I feel comfortable with that. The whole moral of the story, there's three order of veins that lies in this area of the arm that we use. Either it's gonna be median cubicle, cephalic or bacillic. I'll talk to you more about the bacillic because the only way that I want you to draw from facilic and all phlebotomy schools teach this, 
If you happen to miss the vein of the basilic vein, the basilic don't lie, doesn't lie on the outside of the arm. It lies on the inside of the arm. We're all female. So I remember it by the uh, underneath the arm, on, underneath the breast, on the breast side. That's where the basilic lies. But until you are a experienced phlebotomist, I will not draw from the basilic vein because if you happen, we're going to talk about angles this weekend. If you happen to have your angle too much and if you're choosing to go into the basilic vein because you feel it and you like that vein, if you go straight through that vein, it's nerves and arteries that lie underneath the basilic. So if you miss it, you can nick a, a, a nerve and nick an artery. So until you are experienced, we do not fool with the basilic really ever. <laughs> Kind of, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll know once you get, once you get comfortable with drawing blood. Okay. But still in your textbook, medium is first, cubicle is second and basilic, B-A-S-I-L-I-C, basilic vein is third. Okay. That's the, that's the veins. Now you can also see that the cephalic have little bitty, they call accessory veins. So on some people, you can see them. I will teach you to feel for your vein because people get nervous. Oh, I can't see nothing. I can't see nothing. You're not going to ever be able to see veins on everybody, depending on the skin type, the skin color, or however. You need to get comfortable with feeling for the vein. If you see the vein, that's just an extra plus that you got. You know, that's just an extra plus you have. Okay, so with that being said, I will continue on with the order of vein, but I do want to put that in your mind that it's an order of vein. So typically, if the patient say it doesn't matter what arm you, you try on me, you do. So this is the order. If it, when you ask me what arm do you prefer, Miss Chopin, and if I tell you oh, it don't matter what arm, they draw for both of them. So you want you may want to check my left arm first. Let's just say my medium cubicle again. You don't really feel nothing. Instead of going to my cephalic on that same arm, you actually go to the median on my other arm, okay? If you don't feel nothing there, then you check for the cephalics, if that makes sense. Because the order of vein is median, cubicle, cephalic, and then basilic. We'll talk, we'll talk way much more about this. But I do want you to understand there's three veins that lie in the area of the arm medium cubicle, cephalic, and basilic. You will be quizzed on it. You will be uh, you're on your national exam, but by the time the course is over with, you should be very well comfortable with the order of veins. It's only three of them, okay? On the arm of the mannequin, we should be able to identify them. Even as students, before we even stick, we will apply once you learn how to tie a tourniquet on Saturday, then I'm going to say, okay, I want us to try to get familiar with feeling for a real vein. That's after we already did the activity on the vein pad. That's also after we already even did the whole venipuncture procedure on the mannequin. After all that, now let's feel for a real vein to see the difference between the mannequins plus a real vein. I just want you to get, just feel. I just want you to get comfortable with the difference between if it's a hard vein, if you don't feel nothing, if you feel something that's spongy and bouncy, then that's the good vein. That's what we want. Okay. So I just want to get you step by step comfortable in the technique. But the order of vein is where we're going to pick up from on um, Saturday with the video after we, you know, kind of get accustomed to one another, find your seating and all that good stuff. Um, but we're moving right along. When I tell you that today is day two and after the weekend, things are going to move, you know, more faster and faster. I just want to let you know, but I just want to do my, my part to make sure that things are explained in this entirety. 